Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Johnson County Public Policy Council Forum for the Overland Park City Council Ward 2. I'm Regan Cusimanio, and I am the co chair of the Overland Park Chamber of Commerce um, Public Policy and Advocate Committee, and I'd like to welcome you. For the next 60 minutes, we will have an opportunity to hear from the candidates about the issues that are important to the business community and the community at large. To start, let me introduce and welcome our candidates for Ward 2. Uh, first, we have Ms. Melissa Cheatham, Tony Medina, and Roger Tarba. Our format will be as follows. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Candidates will then have two minutes each to respond to questions prepared by the council, um, and then we'll conclude with a two-minute closing statement. Um, prior to starting the order of speaking, it was drawn at random, and we'll start our opening statement with Roger Tarbutton. And so I will turn it over to you, Roger, for your two-minute opening statement. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the Chamber for hosting this event. And I, at the same time, I'd like to thank the Chamber for all the great work they do over the years in encouraging local businesses and also in attracting new business and development to Ward 2 and to Overland Park. I have uh, worked closely with business development throughout my career, having worked for Johnson County's legal department. Uh, during that period in time, I did such things as uh, drafted and negotiated transfer agreements uh, between the city's uh, transfer of their septic sewer systems over to Johnson County Wastewater. Uh, we did this with several cities over the years, Leewood, uh, Lenexa, Mission Hills, and Lake Quivira. And uh, I was uh, primarily responsible for the legal uh, negotiation of agreements to transfer these uh, entities over to wastewater. This saved a great deal of taxpayer money because it uh, increased the scope of the sewer system and created efficiencies of scale. Also, during that time, I uh, collected taxes in bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, in one case alone, I collected over $2 million in the Overland Park Merchandise Mark bankruptcy. And so I'm very aware of and have worked closely with uh, other governmental officials and the business community. I look forward to working with the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, on the City Council. It's the Council's uh, authority and responsibility to take the new development proposals that are attracted by the Chamber of Commerce and uh, determine whether or not they fit within these neighborhood structure and scope of the zoning regulations of the city and if not to try to modify them so that they will and encourage their development and adopt them for the city. Thank you. All right, next we have Tony Medina. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for those viewing live. And uh, if you're later watching the recording or you're watching live from home now, thank you for taking time um, getting to know myself as a candidate, as well as uh, Roger and Melissa here, too. It's uh, an honor to be here with both of them. Um, so, uh, you know, the number one question candidates up here is why are you running? And uh, my answer to that is quite simple. Um, I'm running because I care. Um, you know, last year I got involved with my neighborhood um, in an effort to oppose a single apartment complex uh, that was proposed to be developed adjacent to single family homes at Ridge Park South. And from there, um, I became more involved, not just the workings of Overland Park City Council, um, but being more in tune with the voice of the residents. Um, we learned a lot throughout that process, and I became much more aware of what was happening, not only within my own neighborhood, but throughout Overland Park as a whole. And uh, so hearing all of that from residents, um, feeling their frustration um, on many different issues, um, led me to um, where I am today as a candidate for Ward 2. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not all bad. I'm not here to say that Things are horrible and I'd like to change everything going on at City Council. That's not the case whatsoever. Simply want to be a voice for the residents in Ward 2 and uh, make a difference in their lives. Thank you. All right, next we have Melissa Chita. 
Hi, my name is Melissa Cheatham, and if you live in Ward 2, I'd be honored to earn your vote for the City Council. Usually when I introduce myself at one of these things, I'll start by saying I'm a mom and a problem solver, but today with, with you, a business audience, I'd like to introduce myself as the daughter of small business owners and the spouse of an entrepreneur. Um, so I really understand up close and personal what it means to be part of the business community from that perspective. I spent a lot of hours as a kid after school at my parents' office coloring with highlighters and typing and filing um, as recreational activities because a business owner really never gets a break. Um, my husband started his technology company right around the same time we started our family. So I was up at night with both sleepless babies and sleepless CEO wondering if he was going to be able to make this work for our family, but also for the families of the employees he had hired who were depending on this business idea that he had um, for their family's livelihood. I talk a lot about choosing to live in Overland Park because it's a great place for families, but some of those same things that make it a great place for families also make it a great place for business. Um, so first, being able to take that risk to start a business is a lot easier when you know you've got great schools that don't require you to pay tuition and you know that you can afford a house payment on startup salary. Um, my husband also would tell you that he found a very supportive community for entrepreneurs here. He found support from the state. Um, he found investors. He found a talented workforce. He found affordable office space. So my perspective is really that we need to do things that work for both families and business, and that those are very closely linked to the success of our city. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So we will start with our first question, um, and we are going to start with Tony Medina. So Tony, your first question is, um, there is a mill levy, a one mill property tax levy um, increased to fund the recommendations of the mental health task force that has been pro proposed for 2022. Do you support the task force recommendations? Do you support increasing the mill levy for this purpose? And if you, uh, please discuss why or why not and how you would fund the recommendations if you support them, but not the mill levy. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I do support the recommendations of the mental health task force. And I've said previously, I also would support this mill levy increase to support the recommendations of the mental health task force. Um, you know, a big part of that mill levy increase is to fund um, crisis in intervention um, training and officers so that when there's a mental health crisis, you don't find a, an officer in his uniform with a gun on his side approaching a person in crisis. Um, you might find instead a plainclothes officer approaching in an unmarked car with a trained uh, mental health professional along their side um, to really assist in that situation and de-escalate it. Um, I know that this is a um, successful model. Um, that there are several jurisdictions throughout Johnson County that already have uh, these crisis intervention teams um, within their forces. Um, and as a board member for the Friends of Johnson County Mental Health Center, um, I've gotten to know quite a few of those officers very well. Um, they do outstanding work. Their communities need them. They make a very positive impact throughout their communities. And um, I'd like to see that expanded in the one park as well. Now, as far as the mill levy, um, it is one mill. Um, the estimates I've seen um, equated to about $40 uh, per year. And um, I've seen others say, well, that's 10% increase. Um, well, yes, if you know, your, your property is $400,000, then um, you know, you're going to see a slight increase. Um, in my opinion, the recommendations of the Mental Health Task Force are well worth $40 per year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, same question. <laughs> Thanks. I was ready for it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I also support the recommendations of the Mental Health Task Force and the changes to the mill levy uh, to fund them. I think mental health is clearly a top priority in this community. It was something that we heard about in the forward OP task uh, community visioning process. Um, it's something I hear about in our schools. It's something I hear about from people when I talk to them in the community. Um, and this was a central recommendation. And I don't see how anyone could say that they support the mental health task force recommendations without supporting 
the creation of a behavioral health unit in our police department and full funding for it. Um, I see this as not just supporting families who are expecting that if they call for help for a child in need, that help is what's gonna be delivered, um, but also really supporting our law enforcement. Um, if we want to have, um, to say we're supporting our law enforcement, then they need this to be part of the tools available to them when they are responding uh, to mental health calls. Um, I will say also that even after this, this um, mill levy change, we will continue to have by far the lowest property taxes in the county. Well worth the investment in our community's health. Thank you. Roger. Yes, I very much support the uh, proposed uh, behavioral health unit development. Uh, when I worked for Johnson County, I was actually counsel for Johnson County Mental Health. And Johnson County Mental Health collaborates with a lot of intergovernmental entities. I would have preferred, and I don't know if this was explored or not, to have seen initially at least to get this uh, department off the ground, the hiring of contract employees. As you know, anytime you hire a full-time equivalent employee, there's a large cost involved with both salary and benefits. In this case, I believe they're hiring 11 new employees. Uh, but I do support the initiative. As far as the uh, one mill levy increase, I would oppose that contingent on being able to find alternatives. And by that, I mean, I think it could have been less expensive and we used contract employees and then maybe transition into full-time equivalents. I think also uh, we could, each year the uh, city council during the budget process looks at all competing interests, or at least they should, and I believe that they do follow that. They prioritize, sometimes they demote a particular need that's no longer necessary or obsolete. Sometimes they increase uh, funding for a need such as this one. I would have preferred that we would have found cost savings in order to fund this program, and I think it certainly would have been possible to have done so. We'll move on to our next question, and we will start with Melissa. What changes, if any, would you like to see in the city's proposed budget for 2022? Thanks for the question. Um, you know, this obviously links very closely with the previous question. And I would start by saying that along with us having the lowest property taxes in the county, we're also one of the leanest organizations in the county. Um, if you look at the number of full-time equivalents on the city staff, um, compared to other large cities in Johnson County, we are among the most efficient. So the idea that there is $1.7 million of efficiency to fund this behavioral health task force is just, I don't think that's reasonable at all. Um, I do think the budget overall reflects the community's priorities, and I would especially say that I support the creation of that mental health task force recommended behavioral health unit um, and its investment. Um, the budget also includes some new hires in other areas that are important to me, like the forestry and parks department, where I hear a lot of residents. Um, those are reasons they moved to Overland Park is um, for the parks and the trees. Um, I do see some other additional funding in the budget for other departments, which I think probably have been operating highly efficiently as well. I understand there's been staffing studies done. Um, for some departments, but maybe not others. So I would like to see a holistic look at what are the staffing needs, where have we been underfunding um, departments, and look at our community priorities before just making a large investment in one single department. Thank you. We will then go to Roger. Yes, uh, I do think there's waste in our budget that could be cut out. An example of this was last fall when $350,000 in COVID funds was actually passed, as, as my understanding, by our city council to be used for uh, video streaming soccer games at the youth soccer complex. There was such a outcry from the public after finding out about this that the council actually reversed their decision. Plus, I think there was some raised eyebrows at the county level because these COVID funds flow down from the federal government to the county and then to the city. I think this is just one example of the type of profligate spending that we have in our budget. And I do believe that if we looked at things more closely, we could cut out a lot of excess. Uh, as far as changes, I would prefer besides wasteful spending being cut out. Uh, I think that we rely to, and, and this is just based on my experience with government in general, there's tends to be an over-reliance on the hiring of outside consultants. 
and these consultants uh, charge exorbitant fees. A lot of these types of studies that, that we ask them to do can be handled in-house. We have a very professional staff that's certainly capable. Thirdly, I think that there's an overlooked reliance upon the use of tax incentives, which reduces the tax base and increases property taxes. A city that's in a top ranked uh, city such as ours in the country to live as far as desirability should not have to rely upon exorbitant use of tax incentives to draw business here. Uh, we should be able to uh, do this just through our normal infrastructure planning and safety. Uh, I understand there are special projects where it's appropriate and distressed property rehabilitation, but in general, I think that we can uh, cut a lot out of our budget in this way. We will finish up this question with Tony. Thank you. Um, I don't have many specifics uh, as far as the proposed 2022 budget, um, but a couple of comments I do have is, <clears throat> is um, number one, uh, I understand that there is a, uh, a shortfall in staffing for our police department specifically. Um, the last number I saw, I believe were 43 officers short. Um, what I'd really like to see is how to fix that. Uh, you know, our, our public safety, our first responders, um, just came through, you know, some tough times, um, as we all did going through um, the pandemic. Um, but if we're 43 officers short, that means that we have officers who are working longer shifts than they should be. We have officers that are working overtime, and perhaps they don't necessarily want to. And we should find ways to staff this department correctly. <clears throat> Um, additionally, um, as Melissa mentioned, there are a few uh, new positions uh, that are offered in the 2022 budget. Um, and some of these are to staff the um, new visitor center at the Arbor Arboretum. And, um, you know, that's, um, uh, again, something that we should look closely at. When we're looking at adding new positions, but we have a shortage in other departments, we really should weigh those. Um, I don't know. I, I think before we approved um, the project at the Arboretum, and we should have looked at the staffing requirements that would be needed and weighed that against our public safety officers um, and really dug deep um, at the committee level, because that's where much of the work for the budget is done, would have really challenged that committee to look into that and see how can we do a better job of supporting our police officers and so that they are fully staffed as we did. Thank you, Tony. We'll move on to question number three, and we will start with Roger. What role, if any, do you believe the city should play in economic development to bring jobs and capital investment to the community? <laughs> yes, uh, kind of follow up on the last question. I think that, uh, you know, we're in the top 10 cities in the country as far as desirable places to live. I really don't think that we need to uh, incentivize economic development through a lot of uh, use of tax incentives. Uh, I understand that there are appropriate circumstances to use tax incentives, and I'm not totally against them. They're there for a reason in the statutes. However, I think in some cases we've abused the statutes and uh, stretched their intent on some of our projects, such as the Brookridge project, which I don't think really met the, the criteria uh, for TIFs that were set out in that statute. And uh, so anyway, uh, in general, I think the way you incentivize growth and development is by maintaining our great infrastructure within the city, uh, maintaining a safe environment for both the residents and the businesses within the city, by adequately funding our police and fire departments, and uh, just creating a general welcoming environment. And I think the city has done a great job in all these things. We need to work on a few things that you're all aware. Uh, there's been complaints about chip seal and, and et cetera. But uh, in general, I think we do a great job of attracting uh, new business. I think the chamber is a great partner in that process. They attract business uh, opportunities. So here uh, we look at those opportunities and, and sift them through our, our uh, codes and regulations to make sure they fit within the environment. So. Uh, I think that uh, these are the ways that we will continue to grow and develop our city. Okay. Next, we will move to Tony. All right, thank you. Um, so, of course, the city plays a role in economic development. Um, it should be focused on improving the overall quality of life throughout Oakland Park. 
That's the most important thing. Um, when we have quality of life here, that's going to attract businesses on its own. Um, additionally, the responsibility of city government is not just to attract businesses, um, but to retain our good businesses, um, it help them to expand, um, but also um, going down to the, not just the business, but the people, um, providing opportunities for the workforce to expand their technical skills, partnering with um, uh, educational uh, institutions, um, partnering with the county, partnering with the state, um, providing ways um, for, you know, for workforce training. Um, that is going to also grow um, business throughout the community. Um, you know, many times when we think economic development, it's only focused on, because that's what we hear so often is, well, what developer is getting what tax incentives? That's not what it's all about. Um, yes, as Roger mentioned, we should take a look at economic development incentives that are, are uh, being approved through developments. Um, should they be rubber stamped? Of course they should not. We should look at each one and uh, review it on its own merits. Um, are TIFs and CIDs relevant? Absolutely, uh, in the appropriate situation. Uh, the city has a great responsibility in economic development and the prosperity of Oakland Park. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, Overland Park is one of the best places in the country to live, work, and play. So I absolutely think that employers want to be here. And one of the reasons for that is that the people they want to hire want to be here. And so job number one is to keep the city working, um, to have this be a place that families like mine and families different than mine want to be. Um, I think that the city has an important role to play in trumpeting our successes, um, and so that's a very important role for economic development. And I do think that there is a role for public investment to create additional economic development. Um, there should not be a rubber stamp on a city as great as ours, but I expect incentives to really help solve problems that the city is facing. Um, so in Ward 2, 95th and Antioch is one of the... Um, you know, signature examples of a successful project where some public investment really revitalized an entire neighborhood, um, increased sales tax revenues, increased property values surrounding it, um, and pay for itself. I also think that we have a city vision in Forward OP to be innovative. And when developers hear innovative, I think what they might be hearing is risky. They haven't done it before if it's innovative. That means they don't have something they can pull off the shelf. It means they're not sure how quickly they're going to earn their money back. They don't know how long it's going to take or exactly what to do. And so I think some public funding can help bridge that innovation gap. Uh, I'm excited about what's happening in downtown Overland Park, and I think that's an example of kind of bridging that innovation gap to create a really energetic gathering place for our community. I was less excited about some of the incentives that went to more traditional suburban development, strip malls, suburban office parks. Um, that also received development incentives. So I look more closely at those, but for those who say we need to end um, this public-private partnership, I really think that would be a mistake and it would be unilateral disarmament really when we know that our neighbors um, are competing for these same jobs and these same employers. Thank you. We'll go on to question number four and we will start with Tony. What do you believe are the greatest challenges the city faces over the next 10 years and how would you address them? Okay, thank you. So um, over the next 10 years, oh, goodness, um, it will just be uh, an acceleration of, of issues that we see today. Um, one of the biggest issues that we hear from residents, and, and I think likely all of us here, um, as we're knocking doors and walking the streets right now um, during our campaigns, is um, about our roads. Um, and right now, there's no plan to do anything about chips in. Um, you know, we've heard from many council members um, that say they are against chip sale. Um, some say they've worked on it for the last three years since they've been elected. Another said he's worked on it for the last 16 years that he's been on council and still nothing's been done. But that problem will just continue until a solution is found. Um, that's just one example of what we see into the next 10 years. Um, another issue is um, really trying to narrow um, what is sometimes perceived as a divide between the older part of the city in the north and the newer part of the city in the south. And, um, you know, really trying, number one, to 
bring everyone together uh, because we are one community. But we know there are certainly infrastructure needs that the north part of the city has that the newer parts in the south do not have. Um, and we have to look at that. We have to look at infrastructure investments in the older parts of our city. That will be a huge challenge in the next 10 years. <clears throat> Beyond that, um, you know, an immediate challenge that uh, should start now and um, continue throughout the next 10 years <clears throat> is the perception that the city council is not listening. Um, I know I've heard from many folks when I'm knocking doors is that that the council doesn't listen, um, they they do as they wish and not as residents wish. And you're always gonna have that perception at some level within our local government and beyond, but it's something we really should address starting now and continuing on um, throughout the next 10 years and beyond. Okay, Melissa. Thank you for the question. Uh, first, I think that the biggest challenge that we're facing is the creeping of some of the toxic politics that we've seen at the national level into our local discourse. Um, these are local, nonpartisan elections for a reason. It's one of the reasons I chose purple as one of my campaign colors. Um, we do not need more drama uh, in our local government. What we really need is collaborative problem solving on behalf of the residents and the public who are depending on us to deliver the core services so that they can live their lives without really worrying too much about what the city council is doing. Um, so I would absolutely commit to continue that collaborative, cooperative approach that has led Overland Park to its successes today. Um, that's maybe more of a big picture answer. Um, on the ground, I think we're talking about the aging infrastructure um, that's wearing out, which has not been something the city's had to deal with. Um, shifting from a new growth kind of perspective into more redevelopment and revitalization, um, as well as revenue challenges as sort of the business model of the city is shifting. Uh, we've seen people working from home. We've seen people shopping from home. Um, and how we continue to balance our budget as a city um, that has had a pretty diverse revenue stream is, is going to be a big challenge going forward and one that you know, I don't claim to have all the answers to. If we if we knew the answers, it wouldn't be a challenge, but I think we're going to tackle it through that kind of collaborative problem solving um, where we do listen and sit around a table together and find solutions. Thank you. Roger. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, some of the challenges we face, uh, urban, urbanization, uh, you know, War II is pretty much a mature area, not a lot of uh, green space there left to develop. Uh, so I think in that area, we need to focus on protecting our neighborhoods, protecting our green space, and uh, not allowing high-rise apartments, for instance, like was proposed at Ranch Mart, right next to a, a neighborhood that's been there for you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, these can be destroyed. Uh, so we need to be very careful of how we urbanize or develop especially mature areas like Ward 2. Uh, so I think that's a priority. Also, uh, in any other part of the city, uh, we need to know that with development and urbanization uh, comes the responsibility to provide city services and infrastructure, police protection, roads, sewers, etc. So uh, it's going to be expensive and uh, we already have high real estate taxes. I know that the city itself has one of the lower uh, real estate taxes. However, when you add that to all the other taxes that we have to pay in Johnson County, it does become high. And I'm, I'm afraid that we're at the tipping point where we're going to start forcing lower income people on fixed income, seniors, et cetera, out of their homes due to those high taxes. So we need to be careful about the rate of urbanization. Also with urbanization comes other problems, high crime, um, it is known statistically that the crime rate uh, in Overland Park has increased over 30 percent during the period of 2016 through 2019. This is violent crime. So uh, crime is, you know, it is increasing. It's something that we have to protect our citizens for. And so we need to be very careful about the uh, costs of urbanization. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question, and we'll start with Melissa. 
do you believe the current city manager form of government we have is appropriate for Oakland Park, or do you favor a strong mayor type of government? I think our current form of government is serving us well. We are one of the top ranked cities in the country for um, places to live, place to raise a family, uh, resident satisfaction is high, we're growing, um, and that is because of the work of our apolitical professional staff. I absolutely support continuing our form of government. We'll move to uh, Roger next. Yes, uh, I support our current form of government. Uh, the strong mayor type of government, based on my research, is one that provides, I think, too much power to the mayor. Uh, my understanding is with that form of government, the mayor can actually fire staff without consulting with the uh, council as a whole. Uh, they can get rid of the city manager, they can fire staff, uh, appoint new replacements. I think that that just uh, increases and focuses too much power in one person. So I would be opposed to going to a strong mayor form of government. Okay, Tony. Thank you. Uh, there's not much different that I can say. Uh, I, I also agree that um, our current form of government is working um, and should continue. Um, as Melissa said, you know, our professional city staff um, is outstanding and um, <clears throat> they do a tremendous job. And you know, the 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 direction that they're under having a city manager. Um, which, you know, of course, being separate than our governing body, um, I feel just works for the residents of Overland Park. Um, we do often hear that, well, they don't listen. Um, and when I say they, we're talking about city council, we're talking about city staff, but, you know, there's unique challenges. Um, there are many people uh, that would agree that they feel that uh, they're fully represented. Um, but, you know, in my experience, and as I said, the reason I'm running is to represent those who feel that they don't have a voice. Um, and, you know, as a member of the governing body, being one of those 12 council members um, serving under the mayor and working with our city manager and then, of course, the um, professional city staff, it, it, it's a model that works and I would continue to support it. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question and we will start with Roger. What specific proposals do you have to support the goal of providing access to affordable housing throughout the city? I think this depends, the answer to this question, I think really depends upon geographically where you're at in the city. Um, Ward 2, as I'm sure you all know, is a, a very mature, older area of the city. Uh, I think that we do have a lot of affordable housing in Ward 2. We have a lot of older apartment units uh, on both sides of Metcalf, on the west side of Ward 2. Uh, so a lot of those, uh, my understanding, or I wouldn't say a lot, but some of those are Section 8 housing that's subsidized through the federal government. Uh, most affordable housing uh, programs flow from the federal government through HUD to the county level, who then administers it locally. So uh, in my opinion, what we should do is work more closely with the county government. And they have a whole panoply of affordable housing options. They have assistance programs for low-income folks to help uh, work fix up and make their homes more energy efficient, that sort of thing. So I think we need to work closer with the county government to uh, stretch the tax dollars to make a more affordable housing. Uh, I think that the uh, real problem with affordable housing is more <clears throat> south of I-435 where you have much higher rents. Uh, I think another problem with affordable housing is we subsidize too many apartment units that are uh, luxury apartments that no one can afford except you know the very wealthy and that just drives up rents uh, in general and, and i think it is counterproductive for affordable housing okay thanks we'll go to tony all right thank you so affordable housing um we, we hear about it a lot um because number one it is an issue um not just in overland park but throughout johnson county and the region uh, it's becoming a, a very popular issue now, of course, because we're all in the middle of campaigns. Uh, it's not an issue we can fix immediately. It's an issue that we need to look at. We need to explore how is this issue being addressed in similar cities throughout the country, because oh, the park is not alone. But it is also an issue that we've got to commit ourselves to. Um, uh, our residents, uh, we owe our residents that. Uh, now, how can we do it? Well, there's a number of ways we could go about it. Um, solving the issue or improving the issue of affordable housing. 
Um, some of them could be uh, changes to current, current zoning ordinances. Um, this could allow for greater density on smaller lots. Um, perhaps you have um, uh, additional housing units than you might traditionally find on a lot. Um, you might find some areas of town where it would be appropriate to go higher than you would traditionally find as well. Also, you could take a look at the permitting process to streamline that, make it more affordable for developers because often there's red tape that can become very expensive. Um, and then we should look at different housing structures. Um, one of them is an accessory dwelling unit, often called an ADU. Um, this could be a small home that you, is placed in the back of a large lot. It could be an addition to an existing home if the lot allows. It could be um, what's commonly referred to as a mother-in-law unit. Um, and that might help some of our aging population um, when they need to find alternative housing solutions that are affordable for them. And then, of course, one of the issues we often find a barrier to um, home ownership is just the overall maintenance. Um, you might have someone who can afford a home, but when you tack on the maintenance involved or they're trying to rehab a home, it's just not affordable. I'd look into programs to support rehabilitation of current homes. Go ahead, Melissa, next. Affordable housing is one of the things that makes Overland Park a great place for families. It was part of uh, what made it easy for my family to choose to live in Overland Park when we had our first child and chose to live here. I had just quit my job uh, to be a stay-at-home mom, and my husband had taken a significant pay cut uh, to start his business, and we could still find a great house uh, in Ward 2 in Overland Park. And, you know, a decade later, I'm not sure that a family in the same situation could find a home in my neighborhood because prices have gone up. So I very much see this as a family issue, a business issue, a middle class issue, not just um, a low income issue. You know, I know a family whose kids go to school with um, with my kids. These are teachers who want to raise their families uh, in the same area and they can't find a house um, where teachers and firefighters can live. And these are absolutely the kinds of people I want to be my neighbors. Um, I was a member of the Housing for All Task Force that was organized by uh, UCS of Johnson County last year. We evaluated 300 pages of recommendations to tackle affordable housing. Definitely can't tackle that in my remaining minute, but a couple that are exciting to me are the accessory dwelling units that the AARP is a big fan of. Um, Overland Park already did some work with the Incremental Development Alliance on how they could change their codes to allow better missing middle housing. So they've done a pretty good job on the apartments and the large single family homes, but the things in the middle. I also took a tour with a community housing development organization to see how you might develop affordable housing options that are really have a public purpose rather than a profit purpose. Um, and I think that is promising. I also think we need to look at the full cost of living in a home um, as part of our affordability conversation. So I've successfully pushed for Overland Park new homes uh, to be the most energy efficient in the county. Um, and that makes it cheaper to live in the home. And, and by the same token, I think if we can find ways to make our communities walkable and bikeable or transit friendly, um, if you can avoid the cost of owning maybe you go down from a two-car family to a one-car family, that makes it more affordable to live in Overland Park and, and solves the problem of affordability for families. Thank you. We'll go on to the next question and we'll start with Tony. Since its founding in 1960, Overland Park leaders have had a long history of visionary planning. What do you believe the city should do today to ensure the city's prosperity for the next 60 years? The next 60 years, all right. Um, you're right, there's a lot of uh, visionary planning, um, and you know there's a lot of plans throughout Overland Park. Um, we talk about um, um, Forward OP, um, that is a vision for the city, um, you know, really relating to the quality of our lives. Um, we talk about uh, Vision Metcalf, that is a plan for redevelopment of the Metcalf border. Those are both um, important plans and, um, of course, uh, uh, visions. Um, We've heard that next year the city will undergo a process to update and review its comprehensive land use plan. And uh, also what we've heard about that is that this will be the first time there will be extensive resident involvement. And when I hear that, I'm a bit shocked uh, that it's the first time because I don't understand how we can have a comprehensive city plan without extensive resident involvement. So I'm excited about that and hope that that holds true. 
Um, I think the things like Bishop Metcalf and um, Ford OP should be reviewed on a very regular basis, should include um, a majority feedback and involvement of our residents, because that's what it's all about. Yes, we need our businesses. We, we need our, our, our business owners to be involved as well. But we also need to hear the voice of the resident because the overall most important thing throughout Overland Park is the quality of life we offer our residents. And so when you talk about the vision for the next 60 years, it's the residents that are most important. And that's where all of our efforts should be focused on. Okay, we'll move to Melissa next. So. I think the key to successful planning and visioning work is going to be engaging a diverse group of Overland Park residents and stakeholders. Um, and that's just means that we're going to have to look at new ways to do things to reach new people. I think that businesses and organizations and cities are most successful when they engage a diverse group of people. I celebrate diversity. Um, I think it makes life more interesting. I think it helps bring new solutions to the table. Um, I have actively encouraged and invited individuals with diverse life experiences to run for office, to join city boards, um, and I would encourage other city leaders to do the same and, and find leaders of communities who we don't see um, in rooms like this or around the tables right now to find out how we can get their voices at the table, um, whether that's that we need to extend an invitation or, or go to them instead of asking them to come to us or if we can use new technology tools to reach people who might not be able to come out um, in the evenings. Um, to a, a public meeting, I think that that's one thing that may be a positive from the pandemic is learning new ways, ways to reach people at home and make their voices heard. Thank you. Roger. Yeah, so I'm visioning. I think you need to ask the question, well, whose vision? Uh, are you going to follow the vision of a few elected officials at City Hall who uh, think that they're experts uh, on pretty much everything, including business? Uh, are you going to follow their vision? Are you going to welcome the input of all the residents uh, of Overland Park. And uh, I was astonished. I ran actually two years ago for city council and lost in a pretty close election. But I was astonished in attending uh, meetings at that time that residents actually had to hold up signs at city council meetings to try and get their, to communicate with their elected officials. There was no public comment period like existed in every other city that I'm aware of, it's a KSC metropolitan area. That was a major uh, position that I took that we needed a public comment period to at least encourage the process. I mean, you can still have a public comment period and not listen, and I'm afraid that has continued to a certain degree, but at least after that election, the city council did take steps and they did adopt a public comment period. So you can actually show up at a meeting and if you wanna make a comment, you can do so. I think we need to expand on that process at the committee level because unlike the county where uh, most decisions are made by the board of county commissioners, at the city level very important decisions are made at the committee level and uh, right now we don't really have a very much opportunity to speak out at committee meetings. So we need to expand upon that. I think that we need citizen input to know what the vision should be for uh, citizens of Overland Park. Thank you. We'll move on to our next question, and we'll start with Melissa. Do you believe the city of Overland Park is heading in the right direction? We are one of the top cities in the country to live and raise a family. I think we are facing new challenges, but we'll really, I think, know uh, soon if we're headed in the right direction or not, right? Um, Maybe the outcome of this election, I think, will tell us a lot about what direction we're heading. I would say my approach is going to be to continue the traditions that have led us to our current success so that we stay on that path. Um, it can be hard to stay at the top, but we're going to do it um, through collaboration, through problem solving, um, through putting residents and businesses' interests together around the table um, to find solutions that will keep our community strong. Okay, we'll go next to Roger. I think that in general we are, but I think that we can certainly improve. Uh, I think that uh, one challenge that we've got is that uh, we tend not to uh, actually enforce the zoning regulations as they are intended in certain circumstances, and primarily over development. Uh, we ran across this when they tried to put a six-story apartment building at Ranch Mart 
Uh, I don't think it fit the golden rule, which sets forth the various criteria. Uh, that rule basically says it, the new development needs to fit in with the surrounding neighborhood. It won't disrupt it. Uh, the, I think the city council was on the verge of passing that and would have had not it been for the outcry of the surrounding neighborhoods. I know Tony was involved in that as well. Uh, we fought that off successfully, at least so far. Uh, a six-story, 300-unit apartment building was just not right for Ranch Mart. As you know, that's a very congested area. So I think that's one problem we have. Uh, we're going to lose our status as one of the top cities, uh, destinations to live. If we continue down this path of ignoring our existing codes and regulations and overdeveloping, Brook Ridge is another prime example of that, but I won't get into that at this point. But uh, I do think that uh, we have a ways to improve, uh, and I think the overuse of tax incentives also spurs this type of overdevelopment. Okay, over next to Tony. Thank you. Um, I, I think. Overall, we're on the right path. We have a great foundation here at Oval Park. Um, Melissa touched on that, 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 you know, how highly rated we are. Um, and, and category after category, I saw it listed today, I think there were 12 categories um, that one publication lists Oval Park in the top 10 of all those categories. Um, so we are doing a lot of things wrong. Um, are there things that we can improve upon? Absolutely. There certainly are. Um, and, you know, right now, uh, again, over my last year of really being more in tune with what's happening um, out of the city council, you know, some of these issues, um, everything from a six story apartment complex uh, to, uh, you know, chip sill on our roads to a camera system with CARES money um, to chickens in people's backyards to um, potential development at the farmer's market, all of these issues concern some citizens, not every citizen, um, but these are issues that people are concerned about. And these are also issues where I hear what well, they're just not listening. And I think it's time for fresh leadership um, uh, among the city council. Time to take a pause and, and, and take a look at where are we? What are the issues that residents um, are most concerned about right now? Um, what is going right and what can we improve upon? And take a level set and say, all right, here's how we continue to go forward. When we talk about these, the vision for the future, um, comprehensive land use plan that will be reviewed next year, all of these different things, we have to take and, and we have to take time to look back and also admit to when we didn't make the best decision. What could we have done? So we have a great foundation. We are on the right path um, going forward. Um, we just need to take some time to pause and reflect and approve upon uh, our tra tra trajectory into the future. Thank you, Tony. We'll move on to our next question and we will start with Roger. Do you believe the city of Overland Park City Council is responsive to the needs of the community? And what is your approach of governance? Right, kind of follow up on my last response. I don't think it's been responsive to the community. Uh, as I indicated two years ago, we didn't even have a public comment period. Uh, you couldn't even go and voice your concerns at, at city council meetings. Uh, unless it was, you know, it was kind of left up to the mayor at his whim. Uh, unless there was a statutory requirement for a public hearing. And sometimes there are uh, statutory requirements for public hearings for certain projects, sometimes there's not. So I think that we are heading in the right direction. We got a public comment period initiated, uh, but we still need our city council to listen at those public commenting periods. We've seen instances just recently where they, they refuse to listen. Uh, we had the incident with the uh, toll lane over at 69 Highway. Uh, it was obvious from the public outcry that people didn't want to pay a toll for a road they already paid for. And it's the state's responsibility. If it's the state's responsibility and it's the most busy stretch of highway in the state of Kansas, you would have thought they would have elevated that to a top priority and got it done. But instead, they held us over a barrel and said, we're not going to start working on this for several years unless you cough up $20 million one way or another. I don't think that was right. Uh, also, we've seen other instances. Uh, they dragged their feet on uh, replacing chip seal for years now. That's been a, a thorn in the side of many citizens, but it's never been properly addressed. 
streets should be a main priority. Our safety depends on it. And I think that uh, we they, they need to become more responsive. And if I'm on a city council, I'll make sure, at least where I sit, that that's done. All right, Tony. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> is the city council responsive? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, uh, I, I think my answer is I, I don't feel they are. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be sitting here. Um, it's one of the primary reasons I'm running, um, because I felt that there was um, a lack of engagement from city council. I felt through my own personal experiences that my voice was not being heard, that I was not being valued as a resident. Now, I don't know who the council and my council members, who they are listening to, but I felt it was not me and the residents in my neighborhood and residents throughout Ward 2 that I talk with. So that's one of the primary reasons I'm running. Um, out of that frustration of not having a responsive, not having responsive representation on the city council. Roger alluded to um, 69 Highway. You know, we heard a lot about that. Um, we heard council say, oh, the majority wanted. But when you really look at the KDOT surveys where only 1,257 respondents out of 200,000 residents responded. That's less than 1% of our residents. You heard from KDOT, you heard from council, the majority want a toll road. Um, yet only 36% answered that survey in the positive, saying that all, most, or some of the time they would use that toll. Only 36%. That doesn't sound like all to me or the majority to me. Um, Again, as I've become more aware of what's happening at city council, the decisions being made by the city council, um, I feel that they are not responsive. Um, and I pledge to be responsive, holding regular community meetings. You might call it a town hall, maybe it's in person, maybe it's by Zoom. Um, again, the technology available now that people are familiar with now allow us to meet more frequently. So the simple answer, no, I don't feel they are. Right, how is that? Well, thanks for the question. Um, my approach to governance is going to be a problem-solving approach, which I have a lot of experience doing already. Um, it's not necessarily agreeing with everyone all the time because we literally cannot agree with everyone all the time when we have different points of view. But it's to listen to all the folks who are at the table, learn from their experiences, their knowledge, incorporate that new information and find ways to move forward to solve a problem. And this is something I've done um, with some of you who are chamber members who are here in the room. Um, you've sat around a table with me as part of the building code stakeholder process. Now, this is one of those examples of really playing the long game. I'm a member of the city's environmental advisory council where we set our work plan priorities um, months ahead of time. And I helped get on that priority list that residents and members of the Environmental Advisory Council should be part of the building code stakeholder process. We're the ones living in the homes, we're the ones paying the bills for those homes, and we should have a seat at the table. Um, we got a seat at that table, and it was me and a lot of home builders. I remember um, one of the city staff said, I hope you don't feel like you're outnumbered. I said, that's not a feeling, that's counting. I am outnumbered. Um, but I pushed um, in that group for us to have greater energy efficiency in our code. Um, we were able to reach consensus, even though we didn't start out in the same place. I pushed for every new home in Overland Park to be ready for electric vehicles and solar panels. Um, the home builders told us that they didn't know enough to, to do that on every home. So instead, we all came together with a consensus recommendation for an incentive program that's going to have lower building permit fees for home builders who voluntarily choose to make their homes ready for those clean energy technologies, um, which just passed city council. We did not start out in the same position, but we learned from each other and we came up with a solution that's going to save Overland Park residents money, put us in a position to use these forward thinking, innovative technologies and move forward. So listening and learning and finding solutions to problems is going to be my approach to governance. Thank you. So we have wrapped up all of our questions and we're going to start with our closing statements. You will have two minutes and we will start with Tony. All right. Thank you. Uh, so first, I, I, I want to 
thank you. Uh, thank the chamber, everyone involved with making this happen, um, allowing you all here in person, those viewing from home, uh, or if you're viewing the recording at a later date, thank you for spending time um, allowing me to share my views, getting to know me and Melissa and Roger. Um, that's important um, to be educated so that you can make the best decision for yourself. Um, of course, I hope that decision's for me. Um, you know, we've talked about Overland Park being highly rated. It's one of the best places to live. I love Overland Park. I've lived here 11 years now. Um, I've never lived in uh, one home longer than I have lived in this home in my entire life. Um, so this truly is my home now. And, and I love it. I want everything that's great about Overland Park to continue. I'm not here to disrupt things. Um, I don't have an agenda. Um, I'm not guided by outside interests. I'm simply here to be a voice for uh, the residents um, throughout War II. Um, I want to listen to them, respect their opinions, because we need council members who are engaged and responsive to the residents. And I've done all this before. Um, I've touched on you know, my work against the Ranch Park South proposal um, and working with my neighbors, listening to their concerns, making a plan of action, going before the city planning commission, going before city council, making sure our voices were heard in the opposition against this six story apartment structure next door to single family homes. And we were successful. We won. And that just shows that I have had that frustration. I have been in the shoes of residents who are facing issues that they're frustrated with. And I can do that work again. That's why I'm running, to be a voice for everyone throughout Overland Park. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to Melissa. Thank you to everyone watching live and at home and to the chamber for hosting. Um, you know, I came to this meeting remembering a couple questions that were asked on both written and uh, previous in-person forums. And they asked, how do you choose between residents and businesses? Um, and my answer to that is that I don't, I don't think that's the choice that we have at hand. It's to find solutions that work for both. Um, residents go shopping at businesses. We eat out at businesses. Um, businesses pay our families' paychecks. Um, so we need to find solutions that work for both. Um, my goal is to find those paths forward, um, to find solutions that work for everyone in our community um, so that we can continue to be a strong place where families like mine and families unlike mine um, want to live, work, and play. Again, my name's Melissa Cheatham. I'm asking for your vote. Early voting starts Saturday, and um, I look forward to working together and hearing from you. Thank you. Roger. Yes, I want to thank uh, the chamber for hosting this event i think all the questions have been fair and they've been on point and i certainly appreciate that i'm sure uh, the other candidates do as well uh, also i want to thank the chamber it's been a great partner for the city over the years it's provided a lot of uh, encouragement to local businesses and also attracted new development uh, then it's the cities, then the ball's kind of in the city's court. Uh, once we get those new developments, we have to make a decision. Are they appropriate for Overland Park? Do they fit within the neighborhood? And, I'm, and when I'm on the city council, I look forward to working with the chamber and handling those types of decisions. Of the, all the candidates up here, I'm the only one who has extensive local government experience. I've worked in local government for 30 years. At the county level, I worked with state government, uh, negotiated many agreements, intergovernmental agreements with other units of government within this county. Uh, so I have uh, by far the most government experience. I have a law degree. Uh, basically, all these governmental units are creatures of statute. Uh, they're basically circumscribed by what they can and cannot do by statute. Uh, there are instances of some home rule but there's still an overlay of statutory authority and constitutional authority that you have to be aware of. I'm aware of all those types of restrictions, having worked with them uh, in and out uh, on an everyday basis for 30 years. I can ask the right questions. I can spot an answer that sounds suspect, and I can do legal research to, to find the correct answer. So I'm asking for your vote on November 3rd. Thank you. I, excuse me, on. I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> August, August 3rd, and maybe November 2. November 3rd would be too late. 
<laughs> well, I would like to thank the Ward 2 candidates for participating today, and I'd like to thank everyone attending and watching online, and I'd especially like to again thank our candidates. Um, we appreciate your time and willingness to serve the community. A recording of this event will be located on the voter education site, which is votejoco.com within the next 48 hours. Uh, finally, we encourage everyone to learn about the candidates and vote. Advanced voting in person will begin Saturday, July 24th, as Melissa said, and polls will be on Election Day, Tuesday, August 3rd, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Thank you for joining us, and have a great evening, everyone.